Welcome to If You Love This Planet. I'm Dr. Helen Caldicott, and in this program we talk about the greatest medical and environmental threats to all life, such as nuclear weapons and nuclear power, global warming, ozone depletion, toxic pollution, deforestation, and many other social and political issues that relate to global well-being. So if you love this planet, keep listening. Hello and welcome to If You Love This Planet. My guest today is Arnie Gunderson, an energy advisor with Fair Winds Associates, a company who provide research analysis and paralegal services around environmental and energy issues. An independent nuclear engineering and safety expert, Arnie provides testimony on nuclear operations, reliability, safety and radiation issues to the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, to congressional and state legislatures, and government agencies and officials throughout the US, Canada and internationally. Arnie Gunderson has been a leading voice globally about the impact of the Fukushima nuclear disaster, and he joins us now. Welcome again, dear Arnie Gunderson. Hi, thanks, Helen. Thanks for having me. Well, um, we will first do Fukushima. Um, I want you to bring us up to date now on what is currently going on there about radiation releases both to the air and to the sea um, and your prognosis for the future about what is going to happen there. So let's start at the beginning. What's happening now? Okay. Well, let's, um, let's talk about um, the condition of each of the, the reactors. Um, reactor 4 remains the most tenuous, and that's the, when you look at it from the water, it's the one furthest to the left. Um, it's the reason it's tenuous is twofold. One, it doesn't have uh, any containment at all over its fuel. The other containments may be broken, but this fuel has no containment. And on top of that, there's a full nuclear core of hot fuel in the pool. So what happened in the last month was um, for a period of a couple days, the pool ran out of cooling water, and um, the, the cooling pump failed, and then the backup pump failed. Got to remember, this is jury rigged stuff, so so uh, uh, none of it is, uh, is is seismic or anything like that. But anyway, both pumps failed, and the pool started to heat up at 10 degrees Celsius or or you know 18 degrees Fahrenheit a day. That's high, now, isn't it? Yeah, you know it it starts at 30 degrees, so it's got to get to 100 Fahrenheit um, in I'm sorry centigrade in order to boil. So it had about seven days before it began to boil. But, you know, if you see in the pictures, this is an enormous pool. Um, so it gives you an idea. Even 18 months after the accident, the, um, that, um, in, in fact, there's a, a lot of heat left over. So uh, they, uh, and then on top of that, it would take about another week for the water to boil off. So essentially, Tokyo Electric had about two weeks to get this problem fixed, and they had it fixed in about two days. So... The good news is they fixed the problem. The bad news is they had the problem. Um, in the bigger sense, though, Tokyo Electric has been ripping off the top of the building and uh, in preparation to build a building over that building so they can get the fuel out. Uh, a lot of uh, emails saying, oh, my God, the building's falling apart. In fact, it's being deliberately um, uh, destroyed. The, um, but Tokyo Electric did announce that um, the, the sides are Boeing, and, um, sides of the building. Saying, sides the of the sides of the building. Yes, are Boeing, and uh, but they're saying, well, it, it's not related to the earthquake. In fact, uh, now this is going to be really geeky stuff here, but it's um, a bow at that spot on the side of the building is something called called the first mode Euler strut buckle, and uh, it's an indication of a of an earthquake hitting and buckling the building. So. I believe that the, the condition of the building is twofold. One, it, it had an explosion, and on top of that, it suffered the earthquake. So uh, it's it's the most tenuous. As long as there's no major earthquake, um, even if they lose cooling, they have about two weeks to fix it. Um, but if there's an earthquake and the building were to crack or the, the pool were to crack or the building were to topple, 
um, you know, it, it certainly um, is, is devastating to Japan and potentially, uh, you know, contaminates the entire northern hemisphere as well. So it's, they've got to move the fuel out um, just as fast as possible to prevent uh, the building from collapsing in the event of an earthquake. Well, how fast are they going? What, what, what's your prognosis for when they can put a new structure up to put the very heavy cranes on top to be able to move the fuel, Arnie? Well, they're finally under pressure, international pressure, as a result of, uh, I'm sure, your readers, I'm sure the Fairwinds readers. Um, uh, the Japanese ambassador, a guy named Akio Matsumura, uh, began a campaign and finally got some worldwide attention. So TEPCO is finally paying attention. You know, but a year ago I said on uh, on another radio show that the solution was to build the building over the building. Yeah. And, and that's exactly what TEPCO announced last month. So they're just taking too long to get to the obvious decision. They claim they can start offloading fuel before the end of the year. That's not going to happen. No. Um, but um, they've you know, the, the, my guess is the soonest they could get a building erected and, uh, uh, you know, in place to do this kind of a fuel move would be uh, 18 months. So we're talking the beginning of 2014. Wow. So we all got to, you know, cross our fingers and hope that there's no, um, that Mother Nature doesn't get angry uh, and the building, the building holds intact. So, Arnie, what's the weight of the fuel in that spent fuel pool number four? How many tons? Oh, it's got, um, it's got fifteen hundred fuel bundles. And how many bundle. how many fuel rods in each bundle? Oh, sixty to a hundred. So there's over almost a million fuel rods. A million sorry, fuel rods. I, had, I can't remember the weight. I think it's about a hundred. Oh, it's more than a hundred tons. Yes, I know it's more than a hundred tons. Yeah. And it's and it's uh, it's a hundred feet above the ground, isn't it? On that damaged yes, correct, building. Correct. And if it goes and, down, it will release um, about 10 times the amount of cesium itself as was released from Chernobyl if, if the pool burns. Is that correct? Yes. The fear, once the fuel becomes uncool, without water in contact with the fuel, it will heat up and the, the zircoloid clad will burn. And at, at that point, um, you know, there, there's no science out here. This is... Uh, something that no one ever anticipated could happen. There's a Brookhaven Labs report that says that um, well over 100,000 people would die and, and 40 or 50 square miles would be contaminated. Um, it would be actually worse in Japan um, because there's more fuel and, um, and the fuel would be lying in a lump at the, uh, on the ground. So it's a place where science would prefer not to go, and let's hope that Mother Nature agrees and doesn't put us there. Well, you know, this um, interview is not going to be played for a few weeks from the taping, but yesterday there were two earthquakes, I think near there, of 4 and 4.5 on the Richter scale. They're not very big, but the ground is still very shaky around there, isn't it? Yes, and the way the Richter scale works is for every 10 earthquakes out of 4, you get one five, and then for every 10 fives, you get one six, and for every 10 sixes, you get one seven. So we're, we are getting a few sixes as well in the area. So that means that on the horizon is a seven. And uh, if um, if the plant were to be hit with a seven, um, uh, not 50 miles away, but near the plant, mm -hmm. um, the uh, the structure would uh, would likely either the pool would buckle or the building would collapse. And uh, both of those are things we none of us want to happen. Well, and the other terrible situation would be on the that the whole complex would have to be evacuated, so therefore that could lead to a cascade of other dreadful events. Is that so, and would you describe them? Yes. Um, actually, it almost happened here in the United States. Um, Dresden 1, which was a reactor that had been shut down, um, had a, uh, it was shut down and mothballed, and they forgot to turn the heat on, and the, the pipes froze and the pool started to drain, uh, they estimated that within another day they would have lost all the fuel pool cooling water. And, and within the NRC report, they talk about lethal radiation out for 100 yards. So if, you, if that Dresden 1 experience gets extrapolated to Fukushima Daiichi Unit 4, 
um, if if it were to dry out, there would be lethal radiation for uh, you know, over a hundred meters, which means that Fukushima Unit Three becomes uninhabitable, and likely Fukushima Unit Two becomes uninhabitable. So the concern is that the the, the gamma radiation flying off from this fuel would make the site so so radioactive that the uh, people would have to withdraw, and uh, and you'd have you know this situation in Unit Four repeating itself in two, three, and one. Um, that's you know that's that's really low probability, but it's it's certainly plausible based on what happened here in the states on Dresden Unit One. When did that happen at Dresden Unit One? Um, in the eighties, um, it uh, the, the unit had been shut down and mothballed, and um, um, a night watchman was walking around, and it was cold. You know, they had turned the heat off, and he had um, he, with a flashlight he found. Uh, 60,000 gallons of water in the basement that hadn't been there the day before. And um, um, he reported it, and they found the pipes had frozen, and uh, the pool was uh, had lost 60,000 gallons of water. Gosh. So it was a close call. It's one of those close calls you don't hear about very often. Um, and Dresden is in Illinois, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay, so let's get back then. You described Building 4, Unit one, unit 4. Let's uh, go systematically through the other situations uh, currently existing at Fukushima. Yeah. The, the most interesting one scientifically and the most frightening one too is Unit 2. They, they put a probe down, not inside the containment, but outside the containment in a building called the Tourist Room. And... They, they found water in the tourist room, and uh, the water was highly radioactive, 1,000 R an hour, which you, know, you and I know is lethal within half an hour. It's, but, but more importantly, they lowered the probe further into the water, and, the, um, and they found when they got to the bottom, it was perhaps 1,000 times higher than that. Good God. And uh, Good God is right. And so what the, uh, what the conclusion is is that fine pieces of nuclear fuel Mm-hmm. have escaped the containment and are lying as a powder on the bottom of the tourist room. So we're not talking a meltdown where it's all concentrated in the middle and it's going into the water table, but these fine pieces have settled out and, and are lying on the bottom. The only thing that can account for exposures that high is, is high small particles of, of nuclear fuel that have... Um, um, that have settled out as the as the water um, the water calmed down. But is so, uh, are they in water? Are these... Yes, they're underwater. Yes, they're underwater. Okay, but they're lying on the concrete, and of course, um, you know, I've always been saying that there's also some downward migration of the water into the water table. So it's a concern to the water table. Uh, it always has been, but this is just one more indication. You know, the big question is how the heck do you decommission something like that? Now, 20 or 30 years from now, this radiation is still going to be yeah. 100 lethal. times lethal. Level. Lethal, yep. So, yes. So I think they get to the point where, you know, they throw some concrete over the top of it and come back in 300 years. So this is uh, um, not something that I can figure out how one would um, would clean up. You might just uh, be better off from the personnel exposure to um, to seal it and, and wait for it to decay in three or four or five hundred years. But Arnie, next. where did these particles come from? Because the fuel's melted, is it, in Unit 2, um, and it's in a sort of corium mass, you know. How did all these particles get to the bottom of the torus, which is a donut-shaped... Uh, they actually escaped the torus, and that's, that's what's fascinating. The torus is still part of the containment. Oh. These are outside the containment in the torus room, which is a building that surrounds that donut. Oh. Um, so, yeah, in Unit 2, it's quite clear that the torus, the junction between the torus and, the, and the, what we call the dry bulb, the, the dry part of the containment, failed. And so there's been a breach of the containment in Unit 2. And um, um, so it, it seems like as a, as they flood the containment, um, that water becomes in contact directly with this fuel because uh-huh. the fuel rods have disintegrated, and it gets carried out and deposited on the floor in the building next to it. Now, is Unit 2 where they had the MOX fuel with plutonium, or is that Unit 3? Unit 3 had the MOX fuel, but mm. it only had 
30 bundles of MOX fuel. Uh-huh. Now, but the, the more important thing on the, on the plutonium is that all of the reactors have plutonium in them because all of them have been operating. And, of course, the uranium-238 becomes plutonium-239 when it absorbs a, a neutron. So there was um, uh, close to a ton of plutonium in each of those reactors um, within the fuel bundle, not in a single location, but you know, scattered throughout the fuel. So there is plutonium-239 in all four reactors uh, as a result of the fact that the fuel was irradiated. A ton of plutonium in each reactor? Yes. So that's four tons of plutonium? Yeah. My, my yeah. God. Yeah, that's a big number, and, and of course you and I know how how dangerous small quantities of plutonium can be. So, yeah, that, that again, makes the cleanup that much more, one, important, and two, that much more difficult. Okay, so that's Unit 2. What about the other other two, Unit 1 and Unit 3, Arnie? Um, unit 1 is uh, similar to Unit 2, um, not much difference to my mind. Uh, unit 3 is still, uh, to use the scientific term, it's a mess. Um Nobody is really getting any really good data out of it because it, there's so much uh, debris and uh, and rubble everywhere. That was the one with the biggest explosion. Well, you called um, it an excursion. You called it a nuclear explosion. Yeah, it, well, first off, there was the difference between a detonation and a deflagration. Uh, deflagration is a slow shock wave. A detonation is a fast shock wave. It certainly was a, a detonation, and I've had explosive experts write to me on the website, the Fairwinds website, and say, you're right, don't give up on that. This was an explosion. Don't let the Nuclear Regulatory Commission uh, sweep it under the a rug. A nuclear explosion. Uh, well, that's it. The second issue is what could cause a detonation. And um, um, because of the location and because of the fact that, that few pieces of nuclear fuel were found off-site, um, it indicates to me that the fuel racks were lifted up and um, the only thing that could cause that is something called a prompt, moderated criticality. A, a nuclear bomb is a fast, unmoderated criticality, and a nuclear reactor is neither of those two. So it wasn't a nuclear bomb, but I believe it was something called a prompt, moderated criticality. And if your listeners want to see one, they did a test back in the 50s at an experiment called Borax, B-O-R-A-X, and you can go up on YouTube and, um, and and watch the experiment, and you'll see a very similar explosion. About two minutes into the video, there's almost the exact um, explosion that we had at uh, Fukushima Daiichi Unit 3. But that's what happened at Chernobyl. Yes, very similar. Okay, so how... Um, all right. So thing, things... Now you're... Is, Sorry. This all got this all got started by what's in the air and what's in the water. Yeah. Um, there's there's not a lot in the air. Um, you'll you'll see those reactors steaming still. They're giving off gas. Unit one, of course, has a cover on it, so most of the gas is captured. Units two and three don't. So whatever uh, steam is coming out of the building is carrying some radiation. Um, Nowhere near what happened in the first week, month, et cetera. But there is some radiation going out airborne. The, the biggest problem is what's in the water. Um, the, the buildings continue to leak into the groundwater. But on top of that, the entire prefecture, in fact, you know, most of northern Japan is contaminated. And now that contamination is reaching the rivers, and we're seeing freshwater fish with um, uh, contamination levels over 2,000 becquerels per kilogram, 2,000 disintegrations per second in every uh, kilogram of, of meat in the fish. That's freshwater fish. We're also seeing uh, in the saltwater fish, um, anchovies and, um, and some other fish also have, um, have uh, significant amounts of cesium-137 and 134. So we've got the signature that we know it came from Fukushima. And, of course, those are at the bottom of the food chain. They work their way up, and, and I believe that you're going to see uh, you know, fish like tuna, salmon, and you know, barracuda, and things at the top of the food chain um, are going to concentrate that cesium. We had one example of that a couple months ago where 
um, a research report was was um, indicated that 15 out of 15 tuna caught off of California were in fact contaminated with uh, radiation from uh, Fukushima. What makes that unique is that the, the the test was actually done way back in in August of last year, and um, the the tuna had to swim for five months across the Pacific Ocean. So they obviously picked up a very high level of radiation in Japan, and then as they grew and as they swam, that level likely dropped. Uh, yet by the time they got to the west coast of America, five months later, they were still, you know, they were still contaminated with both cesium 134 and 137. So I think we're going to see that. You know, for for years to come, uh, we're going to see contaminated um, fish in the Pacific and freshwater fish in Japan. And I've been encouraging people on the West Coast to, to demand of their state government to take some samples. Um, and um, Because the U.S. government is not taking samples. And, of course, what samples are being taken, um, if it's below a, an arbitrary number, the, the, the authorities are not announcing what that number is. I'm sure the, the authorities have caught fish and they're contaminated, and they, to avoid a public health scare or more likely to avoid a, a, a business collapse in the fisheries, uh, they're not telling people what the number is. Is the radiation high or low? I don't know. Uh, but uh, you know, I'm sure they're detecting it in, um, in, in fish, even on the west coast of the United States. Yeah. Well, what they say is it's don't worry about it's below levels that you need to worry about. And that's an absolute lie because, you know, if you eat some cesium in your fish... And it gets into your brain, you know, just a, a, a small amount, very small amount, or into your heart muscle or into your pancreas or wherever, uh, that cesium stays in your body for a long time. So therefore, the surrounding cells receive an ongoing dose of radiation, beta radiation and gamma radiation, which will mutate the genes in the cells which could later induce cancer. So what really gets to me, Arnie Gunderson, is that the authorities, even this new report from the diet on the abnormalities, the human abnormalities in Japanese culture that induced the accident at Fukushima, they only are still talking about external radiation, which means that if you're immersed in a cloud of radioactive nuclides, you'll get some gamma radiation like X-rays or from the ground shine, the stuff that's on the ground and kids are playing on the ground and the gamma radiation is being given off by the cesium and, and other such nuclides. But they're not, they're still not talking about the stuff that gets into your body in the food, the internal emitters. Do you want to talk about that, Arnie? Because you can tell it makes yep. me very frustrated. Even those people who are extremely well-intentioned um, are still ignorant, it seems, about internal emitters. Well, I think there's a couple items there. Um, first off, you know, there's this you know, linear non-threshold, so there is no de minimis number below which you're safe. But more importantly, if, if essentially it did, the data tells me if they caught 15 tuna and all 15 were radioactive, that's a pretty good indication that almost every tuna in the Pacific is radioactive. Yeah, yeah. So while, they, while there is low concentration, there's a lot of people eating that, so that therefore there will be cancers as a result of this. The other thing is that um, cesium, people are saying, well, the cesium's already decaying away. You know, the 134 has a two-year half-life. And yes, that's good, but the 134 has twice the energy of a 130, twice of the, 130. the radiation. Yep, twice the twice radiation. The power. It's yep. got a two a two million electron volt um, uh, decay compared to a one million electron volt decay. So um, the 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 134, while it's around, uh, packs much more of a wallop than a 137. Yeah, but it'll be around for 20 years. You multiply half life yeah. by 10 or 20. You know, so it's around a long time. So that yeah. argument is yeah. fallacious. Yep. But so I, let's get back to the Japanese that are exposed to this, which is one of the things the diet was talking about. Um, and really, we should talk more about the diet report, the broader implications. Yes. But the, on the dose issue, um, you're absolutely right. You know, people are walking around with a Geiger counter in their hand at waist level. Yeah. And uh, if it's 
relatively low within where background used to be plus or minus, uh, you know, 100%. Um, they, they feel like, well, okay, this is the best I can do. I'm safe. But what we're finding, and I'm working with some scientists in Europe on this, um, we're getting house dust from as far away as 100 miles. And uh, people are sending us uh, samples. And, uh, if you're interested in that, you can check on the Fairwinds website, and we can we can put you in touch with that. But people are sending us vacuum samples of the house dust. And um, in Japan, in Japan, yes. In but but still not right um, a couple miles away from the, the Daiichi units, but as far away as 100 kilometers. Uh, and we're finding. Uh, Levels on the on the order of tens of thousands of becquerels per kilogram. What? And in one tens case, of thousands. One case, yes, per kilogram of dust. Now, there's not a lot of dust. You know, it takes a lot of dust to make a kilogram, but still, when you you know, if you use an apples to apples comparison, kilograms uh, is, seems to be the standard. We're seeing tens of thousands of becquerels per kilogram in the dust. And, of course, the Japanese sleep on the floor. You know, at the end of the day, they roll their mats out and they sleep on the floor, so they're where the dust is. And and that's creating, uh, you know, internal emitters, hot particles and, and more distributed uh, radiation um, that these people are um, unaware of. So, um, you know, what, what, um, uh, what scientists are now doing in, in Europe, and uh, I'm privy to their data, is they're, they're getting this material, and um, um, uh, yeah, your reaction was just my reaction. Oh my God, tens of thousands of becquerels per kilogram, and the answer is yes. And if it's on the shoes, it's in the kids' hands, and it's you know in their mouths and all that kind and of stuff. And their lungs. So you know, if at the very least, the Japanese government owes it to their people to explain how to maintain a house with as little of this radiation as possible. Um, you know, frankly, um, uh, they, they are not doing that. They're ignoring the issue, just like you said, of, uh, of these internal emitters. Yeah, but it's in the house dust. Therefore, the d- dust in the house comes from outside. So it's all over the ground where the children are playing. It's been blown up in the wind. It's been concentrated in the food that they grow that's planted in the soil where the radiation is. I mean, I... Uh, <laughs> It's almost beyond compare. Now, let's now talk, Arnie Gunderson, about the report that's just been produced and commissioned by the Diet, which is the Japanese Parliament. On the accident, um, They were uh, the commissioners were independent people, some physicists, one a, a doctor specialising in radiation and others, and I found the report to be very informative um, and extremely concerning. And as I read it, I thought, my God, this could be applied to the Nuclear Regulatory Commission and all the government agencies in America, but more so. So would you like to talk about the report, please, Arnie, and its implications? Sure. Uh, there's a copy of it on the Fairwind site. You can get them on the web in, in, at other locations Is that the well. summary or the full report as well? The, the 88-page um, Some- English um, Summary. Summary. The full report is over 600, and um, the last I heard, it hadn't been translated yet. But yeah. you know, perhaps it will by the time the show goes on the air. The um, uh, so the the diet, the parliament published the, uh, a report. Um, I was interviewed by a couple of their members when I was in Tokyo back in in February, and the, these guys are are not scientists, but they were you know citizen legislators. From, from different backgrounds, and they were just very concerned to get to the truth, and there was no attempt to, um, to cover anything up. So what the study found is that um, two pieces. One, the Japanese had ample warning, uh, perhaps 20 or 30 years, that a tsunami of this magnitude was likely and ignored it. Um, mm. And they blamed that on the, uh, on the cozy relationship between the, uh, the regulator, uh, uh, NISA, and, uh, and Tokyo Electric. Um, and then uh, the second half is that the Japanese reaction to the earthquake and tsunami was abysmal. And uh, they also blame that on uh, some uh, breakdowns in trust between Tokyo Electric and the government, and also some cultural issues relating to the Japanese and their 
uh, respect for authority. But but I agree with you. You know, the real issue is is um, uh, not to be um, uh, constrained to just Japan. Um, the IAEA, the International Atomic Energy Agency, was in Japan for 30 years, and they never talked about the cultural issues within Japan. So now that Japan has a problem, everybody's blaming the culture within the Japanese thing. But these reactors were made by an American firm, General Electric, and, and designed by an American firm, Abasco. So it's hard to blame the Japanese culture on, a, on the failures of an American design. And you're absolutely right. Um, the same thing is happening here in, in America. We've got a captured regulator. Um, congressional pressure on the Nuclear Regulatory Commission resulted in Chairman Yasko resigning. Uh, Chairman Yasko resigned at the beginning of July, and um, um, he was under pressure for months from Congress, including congressional hearings about his management style. And finally, he said, enough is enough. I'm out of here. Um, so this is an industry, and it's not a Democrat-Republican. There's some, there are some good legislators like Ed Markey uh, in the House and uh, Bernie Sanders in the Senate. But by and large, the nuclear industry controls both the Democratic Party and the Republican Party when it comes to nuclear policy. So the, the, to expect the regulator to do its job when uh, it's witnessed, it's the chairman getting pu- pulled on the carpet from, from Congress, um, I don't think that's going to happen. Uh, the problem starts and can stop at the Congress, and once they demand that the regulator actually regulate, um, we stand a better chance of, uh, of, of uh, or, you know, decent regulation here in the United States. Yeah, but look, let's be frank, the intrigue and the, wicked I have to say, wickedness of the nuclear industry, which don't give one flying goddamn <laughs> about the people. When you read the report from the Diet, the cover-ups of abnormalities that have occurred time and time and time again or lack of investigation into abnormalities, it's exactly the same in America. I mean, I... I don't know why there hasn't been a proper meltdown yet in America, but it's even more, uh, what's a word, not intriguing, but the intrigue and the, and the corruption, I think, is more profound in America than it is in Japan, number one. Number two, behind the nuclear power industry, of course, is the weapons industry. And the... And, and the association between the ongoing nuclear weapons industry, which is so powerful, and the nuclear power industry, that they're incestuous and they have so much money, which is taxpayers' money, that they shovel into the pockets of all or most of the congressional and Senate uh, representatives. And it's, just, it's exactly the same as what happened with Ted Cohen and the Japanese government. Uh, I... And... and what we need to be able to do is to use this report on Fukushima and translocate that in a very powerful way into the American um, cultural climate, if you will, on all things nuclear. Could, would you like to address that, Arnie? Um, yeah, as a, as a former member of the nuclear industry, I... I can assure you that not everyone is wicked. <laughs> no, I don't mean that. You know, I was <laughs> generic. I was being generic, yeah. Okay. Um, you know, I think uh, it's, it's the, the, the plants are robust, but that's, and, and, but yet it's really a matter of luck. The Japanese were unlucky, and so far the Americans haven't had an act of God or a terrorist act that's provoked the same thing that happened in Japan. But... But to my way of thinking, it, it's just that the Japanese were unlucky. You know, if you look at the Oconee units, which are in South Carolina, 10 miles upstream is a huge hydroelectric dam. If the dam were to fail, a, a wave on the order of 60 feet or you know, 20-meter wave would hit the site and cause the exact problem we had at Fukushima. But we assume the dam won't fail, and the odds are that's true, but the odds are you're not going to get a 45-foot tsunami either. So... Um, it, uh, the secret is in the assumptions. And uh, the, the plants, what, even right before Fukushima, uh, right before the Daiichi accident, I was saying 
we should never build coal. We should focus on renewables and, and uh, uh, smart grids and distributed power and energy conservation. But if we can't do that, we should go to nuclear. So I was saying that two years ago. And Two years but, ago, Ani, were you? Yeah. So, oh, wow. So that was my, out of uh, the world's fallback could be nuclear. I was saying that. And, but Fukushima Daiichi told, taught me that we are just not smart enough to design something strong enough uh, to anticipate what Mother Nature can throw at us. Um, the, the East Coast earthquake that hit the, um, uh, the North Anna plant, it was a six. The plant was designed for a six, and everybody's happy. Well, you shouldn't be happy because if a six occurred, that means a seven is likely. And the plant can't withstand a seven. So, you know, the industry is saying, well, we built a robust plant. Well, if you had a six in the 30-year life of the plant, it's probable that you're going to have a seven, and you know the plant can't withstand it. So the secret is in the assumptions. And if you raise the level of expectation, if you raise the assumption to a seven, the plant becomes so expensive it can't be operated. So what happens with the nuclear regulator is they walk that fine line and they don't want to force these plants to shut down for philosophical reasons, you know. And uh, so they, um, they don't demand a standard high enough to assure that, um, that, a, that a Daiichi accident won't happen here. Well, then you could talk about Fort, Fort Calhoun and the floods. That, that was pretty uh, tenuous, right? Well, that was a close call, and, and there's two pieces to that. I got to pat the NRC on the back. It would have been, all, it would have been a lot worse had the NRC not 18 months before said your flood protection is abysmal, and Fort Calhoun said no, it's not, and they got into a contest. But the NRC said your fort, your, your flood protection is abysmal, and they made them improve the flood protection. So the good news is there's a case where the NRC um, stood up and got improved flood protection. But the bad news is what happened at Fort Calhoun, which essentially a flood surrounded the entire nuclear power plant, wasn't the worst case. There were upstream dams that were under extraordinary pressure. And if one dam had failed upstream, uh, a wave would have come down and caused the next one to fail and the next one to fail. And the net effect is, a, a, you know, not a tsunami, but a raising in the water level to the, uh, to the point where the plant could not have withstood it. It didn't happen. That doesn't, you know, sort of like whistling by the graveyard here, though. It didn't happen this time, but in a world that I live in, which is low probability, high consequence accidents, I don't think we're taking a look at either side of that correctly. The consequences were underestimating, and the probabilities were underestimating. So the net effect is we have this false sense of security. All right, so now, Annie Gunderson, Talk about the impacts of global warming upon the nuclear power industry. Uh, nuclear plants, um, um, per kilowatt, a nuclear plant gives off more heat than a coal plant or a gas plant or any other type of, of power plant. Um, it's something called the Carnot efficiency. Nuclear plants are very inefficient. Um, so despite the fact that everybody says, well, they're modern technology, in fact, the, the thermal efficiency of a nuclear plant is much worse than a coal plant or a gas-fired plant or any other power plant. So what that means is that they consume an enormous amount of water uh, to, keep them, to keep them operating. Um, Indian Point uses, uh, which is just north of New York City, uses 2 billion gallons a day of the Hudson River to keep it cool. Well... With global warming, two things are happening. One is the rivers are warming up. We had a case in Alabama where the Browns Ferry units had to cut their power in half because the, the river upon which they cool got so hot that uh, they, they were essentially going to fry every fish in the river. Uh, so for the last two years, Browns Ferry, in the summer, exactly when the power was needed, had to had to cut back to half power. Three nuclear plants in a row had to cut back to half power. That's happened elsewhere, too. So the, one of the impacts of global warming is that the cooling water that they rely on is getting warmer, which means that the plants have to, sh to reduce power at the very time you need it. It happened in France uh, a couple years ago in a drought where the cooling water, there wasn't enough of it. 
and uh, they had to shut down some nuclear plants in France as well and wound up importing power from their surrounding uh, neighbors. So number one global warming issue is the, um, uh, the day-to-day issue of the river flow is tenuous. Sometimes they're dry, sometimes it's floods like Port Calhoun. But, the, uh, but more importantly, the river temperature is bad. But the second problem is that we build these plants with the design bases of a flood, a historical flood. We look back in history for a couple thousand years and we say, what was the worst flood that, that, that this area had? But the world is changing. Mm. The, you know, the likelihood of a, uh, of a more severe hurricane or more rainfall means that, in fact, what we thought was the worst flood, and maybe we design against that, may not be the worst flood for the next 20 or 30 years. Because you know Mother Nature's throwing things at us that we hadn't expected. Happened here in Vermont. We had them, this Hurricane Irene, and you know towns that were dry for more than 150 years got flooded out. That's a global warming phenomena, and I think we can anticipate stronger, stronger storms, higher storm surges, and more rainfall. So, um, are the plants designed for that? Not based on history. Okay, then what about loss of uh, external power? You know, you're having that that storm that came from straight from Chicago over to Washington, D.C. and knocked out hundreds of thousands of of homes and and they lost their electricity. You lose your electricity from your reactor and maybe your emergency diesel generators don't start and you've got a Fukushima on your hands. Uh, yeah, it, the, it, it's interesting. Here's a plant that makes electricity that desperately needs electricity yes. to keep it cool. Yes. And, uh, yeah, the, the, um, uh, uh, we call it the loop, loss of off-site, uh, L-O-O-P, loss of off-site power, um, is, uh, is a problem. There are two diesels on every nuclear reactor. Some have more that, that usually start up. Usually. I was at a nuclear, yeah, I was at a nuclear plant in the 70s, and we had two. And we, we lost off-site power in a hurricane, and we threw the switch, and only one turned on. So the only thing between us and a meltdown was that one diesel. And for six hours, you just pray that it keeps running until we were able to restore off-site power. Um, it's, um, it's, it's gut-wrenching when you're down to your last line of defense. Um, so, you know, that's, uh, but the theory is that the diesels carry you through a loss of off-site uh, The theory, power. theory, it's yep. all theory. The other one, though, is this loss of the ultimate heat sink, which is uh, if, a, um, if a tsunami or a terrorist act knocks out the cooling water at the ocean. Um, there was a case over in, in, uh, in Pilgrim at, in, in Massachusetts where a, a Norwegian um, sailboat in the middle of the night, anchored right off the nuclear plant. Well, if that had been Tim McVeigh in that boat, and he had a boatload of high explosives, Mm -hmm. he could have caused a meltdown, not because he would have blown the diesels up, but because he would have blown the pumps that cool the diesels up. So the, the service water system is vulnerable. The NRC knows this and has it on the back burner. As a result of Fukushima, one of the things they're looking at is the loss of the ultimate heat sink. But it's so far down the road, uh, you know, perhaps six, seven, eight years before they ever get to trying to evaluate it. Well, you know, I was in Bobby Kennedy's boat, uh, the Riverkeeper, off Indian Point a couple of years ago, and it was a clear, quiet day. And Indian Point, each reactor takes in, well, you said uh, it's about a million gallons a minute from the Hudson, and there are two reactors operating there. Um, it was supposed to be protected by the Coast Guard, but we were quite close to the plant, and it was abs- there was no one around, no one. And I, I've written, if I'd been Timothy McVeigh with a boat load full of uh, fertilizer explosives, I could have destroyed both the intake pipes at Indian Point, and within an hour or two, they would have melted, and, and that would have been the end of Manhattan. I mean, it was just a sitting duck. Yeah, this is a problem the NRC uh, is refusing to acknowledge. Really, really. There's, you know, the Navy, when the Navy brings a submarine in, they put these floating barriers around the submarine to prevent the terrorists from driving into the side of the submarine. Well, you could do that off a nuclear plant, except the Nuclear Regulatory Commission doesn't demand that these utilities put these floating barriers around the plant to prevent exactly what you're saying. 
because it costs money, and they just don't want to burden the people who run these plants. Now, then we've got sea level rise and and catastrophic storms in the oceans that are occurring more and more frequently, and many of the reactors, Sani, have built at, 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 at sea level. Yeah, that's interesting. There's a, there's a plant down in Florida, Turkey Point, and there's several gas plants and, and, and things like that on the site, and there's two nuclear plants. So it's Turkey Point 3 and 4. So 1 and 2 are gas, and 5 and, and five is gas. But So 3 and 4 were built 40 years ago, and they have one storm surge, for a um, uh, for the anticipated storm that they thought about 40 years ago, well now Florida Power and Light is talking about building two more called six and seven Turkey Point six and seven. Well, when you look at the new storm surge, it's a couple meters higher than the old storm surge. What is so a storm new... surge? What is a storm surge? Oh, when a, when a hurricane comes in, it's a low pressure, and at the center of the hurricane the water, the sea level, can be as much as 15 or 20 feet, 7 meters higher than, um, than outside the center of the hurricane. The eye has a higher water level than the, than the sides of the oh, hurricane. Right. So if the hurricane were to come in, the, the new reactors realize that the storm surge is going to be really bad. The old reactors were not forced to change so the old reactors can't withstand the storm surge that the new reactors can withstand. So there's an example of, of, of a double standard. You know, the, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission said, yeah, but they were grandfathered in. We, you know, the, the, what we thought was the best decision we could make back in 1970, you've got to live with. And, and I'm of the opinion, no, if you've got better science, you change the, the design basis. You make the plant more robust. But if you do that, they get so expensive, they have to shut down. Okay, now let's talk about the NRC's new dictum on radiation exposure to say that if there's a meltdown, you don't have to worry because, in fact, there's new data from an MIT study that looked at radiation effects upon mice which is um, and was funded by the nuclear uh, industry, this study, which is... Um, which is a very fallacious study, but using that study, they're saying, don't worry, people can be exposed to radiation, it's not too serious, and we, we therefore don't really have to evacuate people if there's a meltdown around a nuclear power plant. Do you want to address that, Arnie Gunderson? Um, yeah, first off, it was an MIT study, and, and you have to remember, MIT has the Tokyo Electric Chair. Tokyo <laughs> Electric has actually <laughs> endowed a chair in the nuclear facility, the faculty at, at MIT. Oh, my so, God. Uh, and they be absolutely objective? I doubt it. Um, rather than, uh, than, than bore your listeners to death with, the, with their detailed breakdown, there's a phenomenal six-minute YouTube video out that dissects this, uh, this MIT thing. And it's by a guy named Ian Goddard, G-O-D-D-A-R-D. Um, and he's got uh, uh, a, a great... He's, he, Ian and I have, have composed one video for the Fairwind site about low-dose radiation. But on his own, he put together a first-rate video that dissects the, uh, um, the, NR, the, the MIT study. Uh, they, they used 15 mice, and they fed them for a, a month, and they determined that radiation was safe, and therefore we should keep 15 million people um, you know, uh, happy after a nuclear accident instead of evacuating. It's, uh, there's a lot of problems with the study, but it made enormous publicity uh, because it was so favorable to the nuclear industry, um, and they controlled the mainstream media. There's so many more important stories that were uh, negative for the nuclear industry didn't ever get the coverage that that one story about the 15 mice uh, did get. And again, it's Ian Goddard and uh, uh, just a great short six-minute video uh, totally uh, destroys their argument. Okay, well now talk about how the NRC's extrapolated from that uh, to evacuation orders if there if there's a meltdown. What well, they've they've gone back on their original uh, study and and decided that it's really not necessary to evacuate many people at all. Yeah, you know, that's been their goal for years. Um, uh, under one of their chairmen, I think it was Dale Klein. Uh, his goal was to eliminate the evacuation plan completely. 
uh, is saying that these plants were so safe they didn't need an evacuation plan. And um, if that's true, I think that's just wonderful. If they don't need an evacuation plan, they don't need Price-Anderson insurance either. And if, if they, if they want to give up the Price-Anderson insurance, then we can gladly accept the fact that they don't need an evacuation plan. Of course, they won't do that. You know, the, the only reason these nuclear plants are operating is because they have uh, you know, the public insurance, Price-Anderson nuclear insurance. Um, so they want the best of both worlds. They want uh, the, the public to insure the risk, and then at the same time they want to say, well, there is no risk, so therefore we don't have to plan for it. But, you know, Arnie, in the light of what's happened in Fukushima, it just takes my breath away. I, I, the, the stupidity, the wickedness of these people to say, you know, you don't really have to evacuate people if there's a meltdown. I mean, imagine Indian Point when it's melting down and, and, and you know, all the people in Westchester County and the sirens are going off and the people are in their cars in gridlock traffic trying to get to their children at daycare centres and their spouses and no one can get out and they're all breathing radioactive stuff from the air and tasting metallic taste in their mouths and the and the and the radioactive cloud is heading towards Manhattan and the the tunnels are blocked the bridges are blocked no one can get out you know i mean can you imagine well if you look at all the assumptions that go into emergency planning they they always assume it occurs on a nice day and all the street lights work and everybody behaves reasonably and, you know, for instance, they assume that you don't go to the daycare center to get your kids. You don't go to the high school or the middle school or the grammar school to get your kids. Buses will come. Believe it or not, bus drivers will volunteer to drive to get your kids out of a high-radiation area. And the last thing the emergency plan counts on are, you know, 700 mothers in their minivans uh, descending upon their, their grammar school to personally evacuate their kids. Another example is uh, up at Seabrook, the emergency plan there. Uh, Seabrook has a, a beautiful public beach very near the plant. And um, on summer weekends, as many as uh, three or 400,000 people are on that beach. And there's only one bridge off. Well, what the NRC did in evaluating the emergency plan there is they flew an airplane down the beach and counted beach blankets on a cloudy Wednesday. <laughs> Oh, God. And, and based on that, they said, oh, we can evacuate this beach, no problem. So, you know, the, it, the secret's in the assumptions again. When you get realistic assumptions and assume that, oh, my God, this might be a tornado that causes the accident, and, oh, my God, none of the streetlights work, and, oh, by the way, mothers are likely to panic and go get their kids as opposed to drive in the other direction and wait for the school bus. Um, when you factor in all those human factors, in fact, the emergency plan doesn't work. The other thing that came out of the diet report, amazingly, was that 80% of the people didn't know that there had been a nuclear accident. So uh, on the day or two after the accident, within you know six, 6 to 10 kilometers, 80% of the people didn't know that there was a meltdown occurring, which talks about, you know, and again, in emergency preparedness, the systems designed to warn people failed, or the people who were designed to, you know, who were expected to listen to the warnings didn't understand the warnings. In any event, um, you know, the, 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 um, the, the assumptions that go into emergency planning are, um, uh, are signif- significantly underestimate the, uh, the peril of, uh, of evacuation. You significantly underestimate in your description how really wicked these people are because, I mean, even a five-year-old child would say, but mummy, you know, or daddy, of course mummies would go to the kindergartens and get their children out and to the schools. And, I mean, being a physician, Arnie, you have to deal with, you know, really concrete issues. Otherwise, you're going to lose your patient. And I can't help but look at this situation as a physician to say, where are these men's brains? Where are they? If they park them somewhere? I mean, they're stupid. It's more than stupid, but they're stupid. You can't assume things like that when you're dealing with the life and death of hundreds of thousands of people. And these reactors are really, they're atomic 
bombs that don't explode with an atomic explosion. But if they go, it's worse than an atomic bomb exploding. And they're sitting there and there's one, I don't know, was it Alvin Weinberger or someone, one great physicist um, pioneer said, well, look, you can have a nuclear plant operating totally normally for 40 years, but it produces all this waste. And that's the problem. Even if it functions normally and there's no accident, you've got all this waste that lasts for hundreds of thousands, if not you know, up to a million years, which is going to leak and contaminate food supplies and the like. So you can argue till the cows come home that the reactor might be safe, that it's not going to be a meltdown, but then, then, then people end at the life of the reactor, whereas they should be extrapolating for a million years beyond that. You know, I have, um, I, I, I believe that people who run them think they're foolproof. Yeah. And they think that Fukushima was the, uh, you know, can't happen ever again. So, but I, I have a saying, and uh, it's sooner or later, in any foolproof system, the fools are going to exceed the proofs. <laughs> yeah, but then you've you've only gone for the forty years, Arnie. You have not. You have not extrapolated to the nuclear waste issue, and as you said, the 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 the, the risk is low of ma- a major accident, but the consequences are, are enormous. And you know, Chernobyl has contaminated now forty percent of Europe for hundreds of years. But but once again, I go back to the legacy we leave our descendants, which is the waste, a carcinogenic legacy. Um, yeah, my and I fear as an engineer. I worry about when the power plant breaks, what, what can happen, and and I know the probabilities are nowhere near as low as what the, the what the Nuclear Regulatory Commission assumes. Mm. Uh, we're dealing with a technology that can destroy a country. Um, you know, forty good years and one bad day wipes it all out. Yeah, can destroy a country. Well, on that really happy note. I'm sorry I got <laughs> I'm sorry <laughs> sorry I got a little emotional, Arnie, but you know how many years have I struggled to save my patients' lives, my children with cystic fibrosis and with leukemia and the like. So I can't help but be a little emotional on account of I love those children and I know that, you know, you feel the same way. So look, once again, a fascinating interview. I'm sure that people will in droves listen to this and we'll get you back in a few months time for another update Arnie if something terrible happens in the interim we'll get you back before then all right Helen thanks for having me thanks lovey bye-bye bye-bye my guest today on if you love this planet was Arnie Gunderson an energy advisor with over 30 years of nuclear power engineering experience in the United States I thank you so much for listening once again And we'll be back next week with another hopefully fascinating program. Bye for now.